Okay. <clears throat> you should have a sheet called The Nature of the Bible. The Nature of the Bible. Uh, that is a reference for you. And also you should have types of translation. We'll probably go over that at the very conclusion of the class. That's also a reference. Um, in other words, I'm not going to be teaching from that, but I want you to have that. You will, you will need that. So three pieces of paper today and your vocabulary sheet back to you. And uh, let's get started. Okay, the authority of God's word. And these are long discussed principles related to the Word of God. When we get into angelology, the study of angels, and in terms of Lucifer in particular, we're going to see how important it is how significant it is. Could we just close those doors, gentlemen? Thank you. That um, the authority of the Word of God is critical to the believer. And to have the basis of that very clear as it pertains to this. So you have verbal, plenary, inspiration. We touched on inspiration already. And this is... This is what we would call orthodox or uh, historical, that a Bible-believing <clears throat> ministry, group, denomination, church embraces this. Whether they define, well, no, they need to define it like this. Whether you not, may not know of that being defined, it certainly is important to be defined. I'm sorry, I have to, st I know that it's being video recorded. Okay. All right. Now, this is what's on our website. This is our, one of the points concerning the, uh, what we believe about the Bible. Uh, you don't have to copy this because it's on the website, so don't, don't even do that, Okay. But I want you to see something that I think is very important here. And because you have... I didn't know this thing had sound effects. Can we do that one more time? On the count of three? <laughs> okay. Let's see, I can't keep it still. Concentrate now. Um, here it is, verbally, plenarily, and inerrantly inspired by God. We're going we're gonna to run over this one. This is, this is quite an interesting area, and we want to get some, some clear definition. But I want you to see that we take it as the authoritative guide for all Christian understanding, life, and ministry. So we go into the application side in our in our uh, doctrinal statement. Um, but just any, any group that believes that the Word of God is the Word of God believes that uh, it is verbal. We're not supposed to be there. Sorry. Just a second. Here we go. Verbal means the Bible in its original languages from first to last and is an exact record of the mind and will of God as he intended to be. It is God-centric. The viewpoint here is from the mouth of God, communicated in its original languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, from first to last. <laughs> I remember a fellow one time, and he says, I believe the Bible from Genesis to maps. 
I said, that's good. Because the maps have, you know, Paul's, the Apostle Paul's, you know, journeys on it. <laughs> but first to last, in an exact record of the mind and will of God as he intended it to be. Then we are going to look at this word, plenary. And it's got some great points to it. I just see that you're still jotting down that definition. By the way, that will be a, a definition that you'll need to know. You'll need to know that one. Inspiration as well. But that's okay. You've got that. Plenary means the entire text of the Bible is equally from God. <clears throat> but it's interesting that not all of the Bible is equal. Or, and I'm going to go into that in just a minute. The entire text of the Bible, plenary means the entire text of the Bible is equally from God. It is all from God's source. But I want you to notice, we have, of course, in the scriptures, historical dates, times, and references from God. We have genealogies, families, households, tribes, people groups. You know, there, there are people groups mentioned in the Bible that don't, are not on the planet anymore. I mean, we don't have, you know, uh, but maybe some artifacts related to that. Archaeology is a huge science that, is, that has been undermined by um, its political and economic advantages in terms of artifacts being found and then being sold on the black market rather than being, um, how, we, how would we say, put, put in for historical references. But, <clears throat> so, sometimes they say, well, the Bible mentions a city and it's not on the map. Then they dig and they find out that's where the city is. Okay? And that's the whole thing about the geographical references also as it relates to that. So the entire text of the Bible is equally from God, whether it's talking about, you know, uh, passing on in Deuteronomy 6, 9, the truths from uh, parents to children. Okay, it's also as inspired and relevant when it's talking about historical events, family genealogies, and literal geographical locations. Okay, inspiration. God's breathing of the word into the scriptures. Writers produced an exhale of canon without waving any of their personal, their own personal attributes. 1,500 years spans the time for which the scriptures were autographed. Over 40 different authors. The great remarkable miracle is the continuity of content and the focus of subject. Yet we see all of the human characteristics of the authors and their humanity did not diminish their authority under the doctrine of inspiration. They were not dictate, you know, they were not, uh, what do they call those things in courts? Stenographers. Thank you. They were not stenographers. Okay. 
They interacted with the word. Yes. 1,500. Now, there's, of course, in the course of all this time, great discussion has been made about <clears throat> the continuity of the scriptures or how, uh, you know, we uh, derived, of course, our translation in the King James, but what about the time in which, of course, before the Bible that we have existed, God had this premise of continuity. Every king would get a copy. Uh, if you've ever seen the president sworn in and, and uh, all the pomp and circumstance that goes along with that, well, Israel, Deuteronomy 17, 18, defines, and it shall be when he, the king, sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and Levites. See, now there's the office that was responsible. The priests and the Levites were not only responsible, of course, for the, in the wilderness, they were responsible for ministering the ordinances in the tabernacle, but they also were the keepers of the scroll. And it's interesting. They were, for all intents and purposes, fanatics. And we can thank God for that. Um, there's a great little scene in uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And when uh, the Lord Jesus comes to read the scriptures in the, in the synagogue. And, uh, of course, you know, and so he reads out of Isaiah. And then, you know, he just kind of looks up and says, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And you got a little choir of Pharisees over in the corner and says, what? What, what? what did he say? Fulfilled in our hearing. And then, um, then somebody says, Rabbi, get, get the scriptures out of his hands. <laughs> and they go up and, you know, he just kind of like takes them out of Jesus' hands, you know, and he puts them in, in the place where they're supposed to be. But they really, you know, um, we said this recently in another class that Israel had no national existence apart from their relationship with God. It is like amazing. They didn't have the politics, the military, the economy that would classify a civilization or a people group. They had God and the scriptures, and what was committed to them was the oracles of God. Yes, sir. Fanatic. Thank you. Fanatic. Good. And if you can't, just do, do one. Of, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yes, they were. Fans of the scriptures. And keepers, very much so. Now, it's interesting that the kings would get a copy. And, of course, the king's responsibility was to read it. And you remember what God told Joshua in the first chapter. I mean, it's, it's interesting, but I don't know what you would think about filling Moses' shoes. But that was like, you just don't step up to that. But Joshua was told of God that if he were to meditate, he would be of good courage. And that meant kind of adventurous, kind of like believing what you're reading. And I kind of think that as, as believers, you know, we, we can be courageous. That because we understand this authority, the authority is not vested in us. It's vested in the word of God that's in us. And we can then, you know, and meditate on this day and night, and you shall have good success, Joshua. And that formula hasn't changed. So if you're the husband of your household, if you're the owner of a business, if you are a 
uh, a minister on any level, you have a copy of this law. And the source is pure. Now, we find when Ezra, and keep in mind that Israel would go into captivity, their temple would be destroyed, uh, Jerusalem would be burned. All of these cataclysmic things would happen. But uniquely, the scriptures were kept. And so we see that Ezra, 7, 7, 10, and 11, made reference to the Word of God and the amazing authority that it had. In fact, um, let's take a, a little detour, not a big one. Good, I like that. To Nehemiah chapter 8, please. Nehemiah chapter 8. Remember we talked about the pulpit and that the place that there is to be had in a believer's life in a Christian's life, that there's an active, powerful, established, functional pulpit in your life. Notice I didn't say uh, celebrity. It is the pulpit that has a communicator in it. Now, in Ezra, I'm sorry, Nehemiah chapter 8, And let's begin verse 3. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from morning until midday. You could imagine how, you know, Ezra would say, now in closing, and he goes another hour. And in closing, and he goes another hour. He was in no rush. Morning until midday, before the men and women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And then he had these other men of God up on the platform. Verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifted up hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. This great obeisance to the word, the authority of the word, the people heard it and something happened to them. Now, I want you to think that they're not doing this out of religious response. They're not doing it because they've been trained, you know, when the preacher says a certain thing, you stand up, and when he says something else, you sit down, or when you bow down. No, this is, this is spontaneous. They had not had this in their life for a, period, a great period of time. Verse 8. So they read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly and gave the sense... Now, that is amazing. And caused them to understand the reading. Do you remember when Philip in Acts was, was sent to the Ethiopian eunuch and he was reading out of Isaiah and he says, you know, how can I understand this unless someone explain?" See, that's pulpit ministry. That's an authoritative place that happens. Yes, I read my Bible. Yes, I study the Word of God. Yes, I pray. Yes, I go to God. Yes, I can get things from God. But I also, 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 and I'm making this an emphasis because the people that are like, are deviating from this aspect. 
And for all the wrong re- well, maybe not all the wrong reasons, but for reasons that they can get reconciled on, people, personality, things, you know. Uh, when I first came to the ministry, the, the, the worship service was all country western music. I was a city boy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'd tap my foot, and, you know, clap my hands. And, you know, but I'm thinking, like, this is not my forte. Okay. But what got me to stay was the pulpit. See, you see all past that other stuff. Got no problem. You know, where the, you know, and by the way, <clears throat> you know, the Bible commands that we love one another. That doesn't mean we have to like one another. <laughs> See, if I'm looking to like something about you, I might find something I don't like about you, so I'm bye bye. But love goes beyond the likes or the dislikes, whatever that might be. And that's where then the authority. See, so now you've got. All of Israel here gathered, and boy, they said that God, you know, they spoke the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Now, then, what happened? Verse 9, Ezra the priest and the Levites taught the people and unto all the people, this day is holy, is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the word of the law. Now, this is, this is amazing because this is conviction. And we don't know, you know what passage was read. We don't know. I mean, we don't get. This is clear biblical teaching. And two things happened. One, they bowed down and worshiped. Secondly, they came under conviction and wept. But then thirdly, and this is critical, they were told to have joy. They were told, don't weep. Verse 10, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be you sorry, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now often we take that last little portion and we, and we, can, we can do things with that. You know, we say to ourselves, boy, the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I get quickened by the joy. And that's fine. That's beautiful. But the premise, the ramp up to that was the word of God. It wasn't just like I woke up today, you know, I got a lot of joy today. Yeah, I feel right on top of the world. No, it means that if I've got a pulpit in my life, I could come in in the dumps. I could come in feeling a little heavy, a little depressed, or weeping, or convicted, or burdened. And then I hear the word of God, and I joy, I enter into the joy of the Lord, and I'm quickened. And it's awesome. And it happens. It all happens under the authority of the word of God. So, this is, this, is, uh, this is great. So now let's go back to um, <clears throat> our portion here. When Ezra was communicating. Beautiful. <clears throat> when the Lord Jesus <clears throat> Christ came, he made no distinction between them and the originals. What are we talking about? The copies that were made, that were kept by the priests and the scribes, he didn't say, oh, you know what? We got to go back and get, uh, you know, that the copy that's in there. He freely quoted from the copies. His word for nearly 1,500 years. Jesus would quote most, we said this already, from the book of Deuteronomy. You've heard it said. And it's interesting that, it, that he puts it in the tense of not, you know, it is written, but he also said you've heard it said. Now, <clears throat> those who wrote or spoke prophecies 
they received it from God. I need someone who could read me Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, and I need someone who can read me 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, and I need someone who could look up 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And uh, if you have Jeremiah 1, 9 and would like to read it out loud, would you raise your hand, please? Okay, Sean, just a second. I'm going to give you the microphone so you can... What do you do for the recording? Thank you, sir. I know. I. Thanks. Should be green. No, it's not green. It is green now. <laughs> then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold... I have put my words in thy mouth. Thank you, sir. Wow. How did they get there? Well, you know what? I went to Yale. God, for a man of God to have the words, put, that's a very humbling proposition. But it happened. And that's how it worked. First Thessalonians 2.13. Who has that? Who would like to read that, please? Thank you. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effective, effectually worketh also in you that believe. Wow. Thank you. You know what that sounds like? Hebrews chapter 4, beginning of verse 4, it says, The word of God did not profit them some because they did not mix faith with what they heard. But see... So for someone to say, well, that's not, that's not the word of men, that's the word of God, is on two levels. One, and by the way, they're referencing not the Old Testament scriptures, but that particular communication that was coming from the apostle. So he's saying, you didn't just say this was our personal opinion or our viewpoint or anything along those lines but you really did believe that the communication that you were receiving was the authoritative word of God, and you mixed faith with that, and that's why it profited you. Okay? And we'll, we'll go into something in a little bit. bit. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Thank you. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Mm -hmm. Perfect meaning sinless, right? <laughs> Hope not. I'm disqualified. Mature. See, the road, the road is for maturity. The objective is that the servant would become as his master. That there's a replication here. So God won't deviate from his word and give us philosophy or literature, but he will give us the word of God so that the man of God might be mature, fully equipped unto what? All or every. Now, I know that some of us here are thinking that, you know, like, I think I have a gift here and I think I have a gift there. In fact, some of you in your, in your um, surveys said, I don't, I don't know if I got a gift at all or I don't know what my gift is. But that's fine. That's good. Because one of the things that will happen is that that will become self-evident. I don't go chasing down like I think, you know, because I, uh, you know, I'm good with my hands that, you know, that means something or... Or even if I'm, I might be musically talented and I can, I, can, I can serve and minister, but that may not be how God would call me 
So, but the Word of God will begin to fit out you for the preciseness and equip you so that you will be able to do it. And it's, it's good. It's good. All right. Inspiration. Beautiful. You know, an uninspired Bible is a Bible that's not open and unread. <laughs> I, I was going to try to get this little video. I went to, uh, to a, a local Christian bookstore. And I went to the Bible section. And I noticed something. That the emphasis on selecting the Bibles had very little to do with the content and much to do with the, the cover. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, you had the Recovery Bible, you had the Siemens Bible, you had the, the Ladies' Tea Bible, you had, I'm serious. And, I mean, it's like this whole section was filled with all these, and, and, and the reason why we're going to take time to go through to understand the, the translation and what it is that you really want to work for, because the if, if, if someone were to get saved in your ministry and you told them, you know, go down to the local bookstore and get yourself a Bible, they will be sold something, not told something. All you ladies, you get something, you got pink on it, you know, just whatever. I mean, it's crazy. And uh, they even had one that had, um, for some guy that hangs out in the woods, <laughs> a camper's Bible, and it had like, you know, like, Camouflage green on it. I said, <laughs> commercialism is a serious problem. <laughs> but anyway, so um, we're going to take a look at uh, we're going to take a look at this. All right. Um, hey, let's let's do this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop out of here. And we are going to... <clears throat> I think I have something here. I know I do. All right. Let's take this sheet, your sheet that says translations, types of translations. Oh, yeah, good. I just have a little bit of time for this. <clears throat> types of translations. Now, the reason, I mean, this is important because there's so many variations and so many. It's not a simple thing to just go and get yourself a Bible. I remember I used to go for real small because I wanted to carry it with me, you know. And uh, so I was looking for the smallest Old and New Testament, you know, and have that. And then I, and somebody says, well, you know, you can get the ones with the column in the middle and everything like that. And I said, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm off for size. Well, I've progressed from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum. Because now, if I were to go and buy a Bible, I'm not looking for the smallest one anymore. I'm looking for the one that's got the biggest print. <laughs> oh, yeah. And because uh, I remember riding... Uh, I used to commute back and forth uh, up in Massachusetts, and I had a 20-minute ride. <laughs> and I, no, we, thank you. I was there, you know, Boston to, not Worcester, but anyway, so. And I had that little translation, and I had it like this, and it was just like, I think that's where I lost my eyesight. I mean, <laughs> I was trying to read this microscopic uh, translation, and, and uh, so now I go for the big. But what we want to see, three things. What is a word-for-word -word translation? What is a 
called a dynamic translation. And what is a paraphrase? Now, the chart here is very quick, very helpful. Um, and you could have either one or a couple of these particular versions, all right? But you need to know what you got in your hands, okay? Someone said to me that they, uh, uh, this was the Bible, <laughs> this was the Bible that their grandmother had. And it was a King James Version, but I think they needed a wheelbarrow to move that thing around. It was, it was huge. It was the one with the big pictures in it. It was huge, white thing, you know. And they came into Bible study like this, you know. And I said, like, you got to be the most spiritual person I know. You know? <laughs> but we want to look at the, the version here. So literal, word for word, and, the, and, and what we're understanding here is what was the premise of the translator? What was the goal of the translator? All right? What was their objective? And in these three Four cases, King James, New King James, English Standard, New American Standard. The objective was to stay as close to the literal meaning of the word, even at the expense of awkward English. And that's what I want you to see, you know, because there's a reason why that it would be like that. That they're often, they're not smooth word for word, one word meaning the exact same word. But, um, but before I make comments as to what I would suggest, you know, you should think about this thing. So King James, New King James, English Standard, New American Standard. Then we have seven Bibles, seven versions, in what's called the dynamic equivalent and a dynamic equivalent takes in consideration the original language, but is willing to sacrifice accuracy for the sake of readability. In other words, it would be, um, but I would, I would say, you know, I would kind of take the Amplified Bible out of this list because it kind of sits by itself in as much as that it attempts to put all the variances in, you know, in front of you that, that are important. But many people have made use of the New International Version not necessarily knowing that it was a dynamic translation. Okay? Thought for thought. Thought for thought. Okay? You get the idea. And it's put in these Bibles, okay? Dynamic equivalent. Then you have 10 versions who fall under the category of paraphrase. It's a paraphrase, all right? And this is for the sake of contemporary, in this case, English, language. Or, and this is, this is not necessarily being critical to the, the translators, but one of the things that they had to come to terms with is that the, God bless us, the average American has a sixth grade vocabulary. This is going international too, by the way. So, uh, The average person has about a 400 word vocabulary. And anything beyond that turns into grunts, expletives, and all the other sorts. So you can see, like, you know, when somebody just, like, starts making a whole lot of noise at you and you don't know what they're saying, they got a low vocabulary. <laughs> you have to read their body language, you know. Uh, but this is something so, uh, interestingly, so when people would say, you know what, I, I can't read, and they say King James or 
or an NSV. I cannot read that because in some measure they may have a deficiency just in vocabulary. They're not unintelligent people, but they just haven't had the vocabulary that has been developed. I kind of think, I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed, you know, uh, one of the great abolitionists in America, W.E.B. Du Bois, learned to read by reading the Bible, King James. So that's an interesting proposition. Somebody says, I'm illiterate. Here's the Bible. All right. So paraphrase. Good news. Philip's Modern English. Living Bible. New Living Bible. Jerusalem Bible. Modern Language. Contemporary English. Uh, CEV, otherwise known as the Promise. Today's English. Worldwide English. And the message. Now, it's important. I'm, I'm, you know, let me... Let me Put this out here, so and so that you you don't get you know I don't know if you're going to get offended, but it doesn't matter. Um, it's important to know what you have. Now, do I use some of these other Bibles? I do. I do. In fact, when I do my when I you know call for my devotionals in the morning, I've got twenty different translations in front of. Because I'm looking for consistency, I'm looking for a duplication of a thought, but I'm also you know, realizing that something could be said, if it doesn't deviate from the translation, that's fine. Okay. However, if I didn't know that the message Bible was a paraphrase, which means that it's subject, it's Translation is really an interpretation. It goes so far as that. All right? That it's not a word for word or a thought for thought, but a paraphrase and kind of like in the setting of the mind of the, of the translator. Now, if you know that and you understand that, you're good. No problem. I know what I'm reading. I understand what his premise is, and, I'm, and that's what I expect. But if I don't know that, and I'm thinking like, yeah, I can really understand this, and I'm, I am light years away from the literal understanding that could be had vis-a-vis a word-for-word -word translation. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. Now, so I would advocate that you have more than one version. But you need to have a version that you can study from. Yes. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I know exactly what you're saying. And the and the question it begs the question that Without an understanding, I'm vulnerable. I'm vulnerable because I, you know, and I'd have to know that the Bible even says that, you know, in terms of adding or taking away. But now, in essence, that is more talking about the totality of the content. Now, when I understand a paraphrase, the paraphrase is an attempt to try to eliminate the awkwardness of. The trans, if I translated word for word, it would be awkward English, and I may not understand it. So what I do is I paraphrase. I, I, am, I've got some examples. I think I do. I do. I got an example coming up, so we'll take a look at it. Um, but let me get back to the point, and, and, and I'm glad you asked that question. To have a study Bible, I don't mean just one that has a lot of footnotes in it, but you really ought to consider that a Bible becomes the, the, the anchor for every other thing that you're going to study, all right? Which means, and the reason why, and this was decades ago, I think I mentioned this, I chose the King James not because I understood Elizabethan English, I don't, but because there are more resources Subsequent resources, language resources, Greek and Hebrew, that are tied into that translation that enables me to, to access the original language. See, that's what I was after. And 
Thus, that's a very good choice. NSAB also has very strong um, supplemental tools that you can have and access through that particular version. Um, that's one approach for that. But I don't just use, I use, I use the word for word, the literal translation as the anchor and the foundation. I can, with it, access the original language. Then I look at, I can look at a dynamic equivalent, understand what now the, the uh, translators were attempting to do with that language. But I know the premise, and that's the key. If I didn't know the premise, if I started off with a paraphrase and tried to work backwards, I'd get lost. But if I start with the premise and work forwards, I can see then, and quite frankly, I'm not at all advocating, but the message is not the message. And I'm amazed because it's a good seller. But it's a good seller because people take it on the basis that I, I can read it. I can read it. And they've been told that, you know, at some level, at some point, some antagonistic person against the Bible says, oh, the Bible, you can't even read it to understand it. Really? I didn't know that. You know, and they, so they think that they're not supposed to be able to read it. And, uh, and then when they find one that they can read, then it's, it's very good. Um, let's take a look here. There are idioms of speech in every language. Idioms of speech. Okay. So and so, yeah, they kicked the bucket. What are we talking about? They died. Okay. Now, if I was making a literal translation of that, I would exegete bucket, a container to hold something. Kick. The use of the leg and foot upon a stationary object. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm far away from what it really does mean. Why? Because it's an idiom of speech. And the Bible has idioms of speech. And the only way to really understand them is that you have to go back into the culture and the time and the audience for which it was addressing. Okay? It may not be an idiom of speech this, that we understand. Okay? I think the, Britons, the, the Brits have something, you know, like when, when you want to say, you know, it's impossible or, you know, it's unbelievable or, you know, they say, can pigs fly? And when I first heard that, I thought, I thought bacon coming out of the pan. I thought, you know, it's the only reference I had. It's right before I was ready to eat breakfast. No, but, you know, that idiom has no reference in my thinking whatsoever. And, and different cultures have different idioms of speech, and so if I, if I miss it, I can, I, I, I can mess with it, okay? Now, this is Genesis 4, 6 in the New American Standard Bible. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? Now, I may not know what countenance means. That's a, that's a good $25 word, okay? And, uh, but it does communicate, all right? So then the NIV says, that, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Does that make any more sense to you? Maybe it does. Okay. In the New Living Translation, why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain, why do you look so dejected? Ah, now I see. Okay. But if I started with the bottom and worked up, okay, versus the top working down, that I think is the key to making proper use of alternate translations as the ones that you may have access to. But you need to nail it that the, the, fun, the, the Bible that you reach for first is not necessarily the one that you can read the best. It's the one that's going to speak literal word for word to you. And then you, you access the other ones as cross-references. Okay? I hope that's, that's helpful. All right, now, um, then also on this uh, 
types of translation. There's uh, the types of Bibles. I put that there, and there's all kinds of, like again, you go to the your Christian bookstore, and they have study Bibles, reference Bibles, place in life Bibles, one year Bibles, pastor's Bible, children's Bible, parallel Bible, chronological Bible, other specialty Bibles. Whew. Just give me the word, man. But in any case, um, if you would like to, and you need further help with that, I'm more than available, and I'm sure anyone else here in the college is too. Or maybe you are, I mean, most of you are probably all ramped up on this. But I cannot assume that, so that's why we mentioned that. Now, I wanted to um, yeah, let me get this, let me get this done. Okay. On the nature of the Bible sheet, seat sheet right there on the back. Turn that over, please. We have a homework assignment. And I just want to go through this, and then we're going to finish up and do something here. The homework assignment is to go to Grace Media Library, message 985. You can enter that in. You don't even have to put the title in. But it's Certain Certainties by Pastor Stevens. And we want you to listen to that, please and then answer the following questions. Number one, what method of evangelism did Pastor Stevens use in winning up to 60% of those whom he spoke to? Two, what is an agnostic, and how does that differ from an atheist? Okay, just those two questions. Listen to the message. Answer those two questions, please. If you have heard certain certainties in the last six months, or you absolutely cannot access GGWO's website, then you are to answer the following questions. And um, yes, you are. And there's three questions here. What does Matthew 24, 35 and 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25 teach us? Number two, what were the conditions to determine the communicator that the communicator was sent by God? The prophetic test of Deuteronomy 18, 14 through 22. Number three, how do you think this kept the scriptures preserved over the centuries? Okay, please, you are to submit your questions on lined paper. Questions are to be written out, your name and mailbox, and that's due for next class. So no electronic submitting, we wanna, I want hard copy on that, please. Bring it to class. Thank you.